Hello and welcome to Joy in Our Town, TV in St. Joseph, Kansas City. I am your host, Lindsay Hardiman, and today we are going to discuss the importance of getting our youth excited about reading, opening those books, and turning those pages, as we are joined with the organization Turn the Page KC. Mike English, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Lindsay. All right, so let's open up and begin by telling us about yourself and your position with the organization. Okay, well, like you said, my name is Mike English. I'm the executive director of Turn the Page KC. So we're a nonprofit organization. We're very new, so we've been around just a, a couple of years as an organization. We were really started by Mayor Sly James um, out of his office a few years ago. Um, but me personally, I've, I'm, I've been in the Kansas City area for many years and have really dedicated myself towards nonprofit work, specifically in education. All right, so what is the mission of this organization and why was there a need for this in our community? Well, our mission is to uh, instigate the community to uh, get all of our kids reading by the end of third grade. Mm -hmm. This is a really important mission, because not just in our community, but in, in really most cities across the country, there's a need for this type of initiative. Mm -hmm. If you can't read by the end of third grade, what happens is you start fourth grade unable really to learn much of anything because as you know and you probably remember from school you start learning social studies and science and math and all of those subjects require you to, to be able to read and so if you can't you start to get be left behind right. and we have some really alarming stats about what happens when you can't read by the end of third grade mm -hmm. uh, you know more more kids drop out of high school mm -hmm. end up incarcerated mm -hmm. so it, it's not just about education it's really about it's it's really a, a an economic development factor, mm -hmm. and it's really a, a, a factor in crime. Mm -hmm. So it's, and Mayor Sly James says this a lot, he says it's our most important economic development issue in Kansas City, getting kids to read by the end of third grade. Okay, so you said that you've been with this organization since the startup. So what type of results have you seen since the startup of this organization? We have seen a lot more commitment mm -hmm. from, I think, schools, but also corporations, uh, uh, foundations, uh, volunteers mm -hmm. in the community. Uh, and I think what, what we track, really, we track the percentage of kids that are reading mm -hmm. by the end of third grade. So when we started this initiative, there were only about a third of our kids in Kansas City, Missouri, were reading by the end of third grade. Mm -hmm. It's still less than half, but we're really on the rise. And right. so we've really seen good results there. And some of the other indicators we track are going in the right direction as well. So mm -hmm. more kids are going to school every day. Mm -hmm. uh, more kids are going to summer school. Mm -hmm. so, so these are the types of things that, that we look at to track our progress. And, and because it's such an urgent issue, we really are, have our eye on a lot of different data to make sure we're, we're, we're doing things the, the right way. All right. Okay, so you said you've been tracking the success of this. So what are some specific issues that contribute to third grade reading success? That's a great question. We, because getting uh, this many kids to read mm -hmm. by third grade is really a pretty big task. But right. we know that by focusing on certain issues, uh, we, can, we can do it. So we focus on summer learning. And so, you know, t traditionally in, in the U.S. Uh, education system, Summer is a time away from school. Right. Kids get a break and they don't learn during the summer. Exactly. Which, in, in our opinion, that's not a good thing mm -hmm. because what happens is kids start in the fall further behind than they were when they ended school. Mm -hmm. So we've been really trying to get as many kids into quality summer programs as we can. Okay. These are programs that, that typically last about six weeks and they teach reading. We okay. provide tutors and other volunteers so that they're learning to read. And we've seen some really good results there. So summer is one issue. Mm -hmm. School attendance is huge. And this is... Probably the most obvious because if kids aren't in school, they're not learning. Uh, right. They're not learning to read, and so we try to get as many kids to school as many days as we can. Mm -hmm. And and the the number of kids that are getting to school more regularly um, is on the rise. Mm -hmm. So those two indicators are going the right direction. The third is what we call uh, school readiness, and so. Uh, the challenge for a lot of elementary schools is that many of their children are starting in kindergarten already f uh, far behind mm -hmm. because as kids are, are growing up from the ages of zero to five, that's when a lot of the brain development happens. Mm -hmm. And so kids who are raised in families that don't, uh, that don't read, um, maybe they're with parents that aren't talking with them quite mm -hmm. as much. They're, they're really not developing uh, the brain that's ready to learn when they get to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And so we actually, we start working with parents and kids when kids are born. And so that's uh -huh. when our program really starts. Uh, and then, of course, 
just increasing the number of kids that are going to preschool and pre-kindergarten is important as well. So those three issues are really the most important. And then I'll, I'll add too that um, tutoring is important as well. So we have really tried to bring in um, more and more paid tutors mm -hmm. in, in schools, specifically schools in the Kansas City Public School District, mm -hmm. um, where there, there are not as many reading specialists as there used to be. And so these paid tutors can work one-on-one -on -one with kids every single day. And we've seen some really good results. All right. So back to, you said, school attendance. How do you all work to make sure that these kids are getting to school and it's, attending? Right. It's hard. That's probably the hardest, <laughs> the hardest issue. Um, what we, we try to identify practices that some schools use mm -hmm. and then help other schools replicate them. Oh, okay. And so um, there's, there's one school in particular called Winwood Elementary School, which is in the North Kansas City School District that had a, a real school attendance problem. Mm -hmm. And they instituted a, a, a team in their school that would meet each week and identify, okay, here are the kids that are missing school. Let's figure out why and let's help, let's help solve the problems. And they've seen some amazing results. I mean, I think the, the number of kids that were sort of on their watch list has dropped from about 100 down to, to about 10. And so what we try to do then is, is um, convene principals and school administrators from other schools that also have attendance problems mm -hmm. and show them this model and try to help them get that started. Right. Okay, that's wonderful. So let's say I am a parent and I have a child and they're wondering, you know, maybe my child's not reading so well, maybe they are. How can they tell if their child is not reading so well? Well, it, like I said before, it starts at birth. And mm -hmm. so the first thing I'd say is if you have a baby um, or a toddler, mm -hmm. Um, just because they can't talk yet doesn't mean you shouldn't be reading with them. Right. And so um, there are some really, really good tips you can find online. There's this website I really like called Vroom, V-R-O-O-M. Mm -hmm. And Vroom has a lot of um, tips for uh, talking and, and really sort of playing with your kids each day, activities you can do. Um, that are really creative for things you can do in the car or at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So check out those kind of ideas, I think, for, for when you have a really small small child. As your, as your child grows older, there are some different benchmarks you can, you can check into. And mm -hmm. um, one, one place I like to look is at um, early childhood programs, see what they say. So, mm -hmm. for example, if you live down in the center school district in Kansas City, uh, they, have some, they have these materials called Made Smart and so they really help parents um, identify, okay, what should my child know at this age mm -hmm. when they're four, when they're five? Mm -hmm. uh, and so those are some things you can see, you can check into to see if your child is on, on track. But then I'm, I'm just going to say from the age of zero until kindergarten, just make sure you read and play and talk with your child as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And then once they're in school, um, talk with the teacher and find out, okay, what are some things that your child needs to work on? It might be as simple as letter recognition. Maybe your child can read, but they're not comprehending as much as they need to, and maybe that's what they need to work on. So right. I would say be as, uh, as um, open a dialogue with your teacher, uh, the, the teacher of your child, as soon as they get to kindergarten and through first, second, third grade. Okay. All right, so we're going to take a few moments to put some information on the screen for our viewers at home. If you are a parent and you would like to get more information about Turn the Page KC, or you simply just want more information about this organization itself, you can give them a call at 816-718-8926, or you can visit the website on the screen at turnthepagekc.org. All right, so speaking about the organization itself, do you host any events? We do. In fact, we, we have started a tradition. We're very new. So <laughs> uh, we, we started a tradition last summer of ha hosting a huge reading festival for kids. And okay. so we, we hosted this at the Sprint Center oh, in downtown wow. Kansas City. We had about um, 1,200 kids come. Wow, uh, and fantastic. we made it into essentially a celebration of reading. Mm -hmm. And so um, Mayor Sly James uh, was there reading with the kids. We had um, all kinds of fun things for mm -hmm. kids that all revolved around reading. So we're going to try to do that every year as a, essentially a celebration of reading during the summer mm -hmm. so that kids don't forget that just because they're not in school doesn't mean they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be reading. Right. And not that we want to make sure kids know, too, that reading is something that's fun. So right. that's what we do there. And then throughout the year... We will host um, symposiums on, on certain topics, but um, our, I think our, our most 
fun event is during the summer, and, and every time the summer is approaching, we'll get more and more information out there specifically to programs that have kids there during the summer. Okay. So I know that you spoke about the tutors that you have. Are all the tutors on a one-on-one -on -one basis? Can it be in a smaller group or a larger group setting? There, there are a few ways that tutoring works. There's a, a separate organization that just got started here that we work with. Uh, it's called uh, the Literacy Lab, and they have something called the Missouri Reading Corps. Mm -hmm. And they actually have um, paid tutors in schools working with kids every single day. Mm -hmm. um, aside from that, we, we recruit volunteers. and so. In the past few years, we've we've recruited um, hundreds of volunteers, mm -hmm. and what our what our volunteers do is either through our organization or some others like an organization called Lead to Read, um, they get tr some brief training on how to really select a book and read with a child based on the child's age, mm -hmm. and then we ask them to commit to going into a school once a week. Uh, for between 30 minutes and an hour. Mm -hmm. And some of this takes place at lunchtime and some okay. in the after school setting. So okay. our goal is to not take kids away from class when, when our, our volunteers are reading with them, right. but to do it over the lunch hour or, um, or after school. So anybody who's interested should, should go to our website. We have a real big uh, button there that says volunteer. <laughs> so you can click it and find out. And, and there are many schools where you can do this. Mm -hmm. So depending on where you live, there's, there's a school that's pr probably nearby where we're looking for volunteers. And I'll just add that it's, it's really fun for the volunteer mm -hmm. because what it does is it gets you connected to a child who you otherwise would not be mm -hmm. connected to. Once a week, you get to see a smiling face of a little kid, right. which can't hurt your day. <laughs> exactly. Um, but also gets you in a school where you might not otherwise go. And right. so that's one of my favorite things about the volunteer uh, programming is that we are bringing in hundreds of people who work in our city Mm -hmm. um, but may not live and send their own kids to schools, mm -hmm. especially in the urban core of our city. Uh, and what we're doing is we're getting them, getting them into these school buildings. So now they, not only do they care about the kids they're working with, but they care about the schools too, which is, which is a great thing. Right. That is wonderful. All right. So just as Mike English just said, if you would like to sign up and volunteer your time, you can visit the website on the screen at turnthepagekc.org or give them a call at 816 718 8926. All right, and in closing, how do you feel and what's your opinion on technology? I know that society is very technological based. Do you feel that this hurts children or it kind of helps them? I used to think it just hurt, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm starting to change my mind a little bit. I, I think that um, w if you think about um, using a phone mm -hmm. or an iPad or a computer mm -hmm. when kids are, are texting, specifically, kids probably read uh, and write more than they ever used to. Mm -hmm. um, the drawback, of course, is it's, it's not necessarily correct grammar <laughs> right. when kids are texting. And so I, see, I, I do see that reflected in the writing mm -hmm. as kids grow a little older uh, and they write a cover letter applying for a job. Right. It, it, it slips, that, that texting uh, type of writing slips into their formal writing, which is not a not a good thing. So um, it, there are some drawbacks, but it's not all bad because mm -hmm. it does, you know, kids actually, in order to, to text, which they love to do, they have to be able to read. Exactly. So uh, it, it's not all bad, but I, I do really want to stress uh, mostly to kids who are teenagers and, and their parents as well that mm -hmm. make sure that the, the, uh, the shorthand you're using in texting is not something that, that translates into uh, your more formal work either at right. school or in the workplace. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in to Joy in Our Town, TVN St. Joseph, Kansas City. I am your host, Lindsay Hardiman, and have a wonderful week. Hi, I'm Judy Akers with Della Lamb Community Services. Della Lamb offers adult services, emergency assistance, youth services, and a host of other services to help low-income families become self-sufficient. We serve 2,000 families every day with programming that helps move families from welfare into the workforce. Call 816-842-8040 or get on our website at delalamb.org and offer your volunteer services. And welcome to Joy in Our Town, TV in St. Joseph, Kansas City. I am your host, Lindsay Hardiman. And in our community today, you would be amazed by how many refugees we have residing in our area. 
So joining with us, we have the Della Lamb Community Services, who will speak with us about their refugee resettlement program. Judy Akers, welcome. Thank you, Lindsay. It's good to be here. Glad you could join us. Thank you. So we're going to open up by telling us a bit about yourself and your position with this organization. Well, I'm Judy Akers. I'm the Executive Director, Executive Vice President of Della Lamb Community Services. Mm -hmm. And the organization uh, is a National United Methodist Mission. We're United Way sponsored. It's been, the organization's been in existence since 1897, mm -hmm. serving low-income Kansas City families. Okay. And today, um, refugee uh, families are among our service, our service base as well. All right, so can you tell us a bit about this refugee program? What is the goal of this program? Well, the goal is to meet the requirements of the Department of Homeland Security okay. and <laughs> to do everything as, as we're required to do and mm -hmm. to help uh, refugees literally become settled mm -hmm. and uh, to help them learn English, to help them uh, secure job training, mm -hmm. uh, put them... Uh, put them into jobs right. and uh, help them uh, secure those initial housing and medical and uh, all of those initial concerns that uh, a family would have upon arrival into a new country. Right. All right, so when was this started? The re resettlement portion uh, has been going on for just a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, Della has been serving refugees and immigrants as well as uh, English-speaking families uh, in the Kansas City area for many years mm -hmm. with all kinds of supportive services. All right. And approximately how many refugees enter into the U.S. a year? Uh, the numbers vary. Mm -hmm. We're, we have been told anywhere from 125 to 200 or so per year. Um, and we don't always know until we get word that right. they're coming. So okay. um, we're supposed to have a couple of weeks notice and and that doesn't always happen. Right. And, but, you know, you respond as best you can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so once they enter into the U.S., is there any type of programs they have to go through before they can even get into a resettlement program? Well, let me just take a step back and mm -hmm. say uh, the definition of a refugee is one who's experiencing crises in their homelands, um, crises that are, are persecution related, uh, persecuted for uh, religious or um, political, uh, any kinds of uh, designated means mm -hmm. of persecution. In order for the person to be designated as a refugee, they must cross the their own country's boundary, right. the border, to go into a second uh, country and uh, to secure that refugee status. From the second country, then they eventually usually come to the U.S. Sometimes there's a third country in between. Mm -hmm. But before they get to the U.S., uh, when they're in that second country, or third country, um, they have to go through a lot of security checks and okay. fingerprinting and uh, all kinds of background screenings prior uh -huh. to getting into the U.S. Okay, so with this refugee resettlement program, roughly how many people can you say you've helped just from the program startup itself and not just working with refugees? Probably 250, 350 families. Okay. And do you see mainly families or adults, or do you even have any cases of an un unaccompanied minor? We, I don't think we yet have received an unaccompanied minor. Uh, we have received quite a few families, okay. but there have been a few single adults or a few uh, just married couples as well, too. Okay. And what are some main issues you see when re refugees resettle to a different area? Well, some of the challenges are, of course, uh, coming into a new country and right. not knowing the language. So right. the whole uh, language communication translation issue really um, serves as a barrier to anything else because uh, that's really, you know, the, the key that opens the door mm -hmm. on everything. Uh, so teaching adults and children as well, English as second language, mm -hmm. is, is just probably the primary goal. Okay. But getting them housed initially into affordable housing, um, 
getting them, uh, getting that housing prepared before they arrive with uh, housewares, with mm -hmm. furniture, with uh, new mattress, box springs, new beds, dishes, pots and pans, um, linens, all the kinds of things that you and I would need if we were going into uh, a situation uh, having left all of those things behind. Mm -hmm. So uh, getting the home, uh, doing the first month's rent, the, de the deposit, turning on the utilities, the, the heat, the, the electricity, the water, all of those kinds of things have to be set up before the family gets here. Right. And then meeting them at the airport with a translator, getting them in, uh, giving them a hot meal that's in a cultural, culturally appropriate manner, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that the translators are there to help with whatever needs that there are, mm -hmm. getting them into their new home that night right. and helping them learn, uh, you know, what the thermostat is for. They mm -hmm. may not have had experience with that. How to dial 911, you know, exactly. what happens in case there's an issue right. uh, overnight uh, before there, our staff gets to them again in the next morning. Mm -hmm. So a lot of intensive training right. just to make it those first 24 hours or for sometimes first 12 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then beyond that, of course, uh, getting them their first medical screenings and um, getting parents enrolled in English as second language, getting children enrolled in school, um, getting parents into job training programs, and then eventually getting the parents into jobs. All right, so overall, just helping them get settled in and making them feel comfortable. Yes, exactly. Right. And the U.S. State Department would like for you to have everybody here and speaking English perfectly <laughs> within, right. you know, 30 to 90 days and in a job and, right. uh, you know, employed as a brain, brain surgeon, you know, with yeah. six-digit income, et cetera. <laughs> All so. right, so we're going to put some information on the screen for our viewers at home. If you would like to get more information about the Della Lamb Community Services or more information about their refugee resettlement program, you can give them a call at 816-842-8040 or visit the website at dellalamb.org. Okay, so let's go back and speak about this English as a Second Language program. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Um, it's, it's literally what the title describes it as, uh, teaching adults uh, to learn to speak and read and write in English. Mm -hmm. And this may seem kind of bizarre to say this, but you, you must hear the language first. It's, it's really a four-step process. They, they must learn to listen mm -hmm. in, in English and then uh, the speaking and then the reading and writing in that order. And uh, so, you know, some of those first lessons, um, well, you can't expect the adult English as second language uh, learner to necessarily come in already learning to read right. because some, some folks come to us um, never having learned to read in their native language. Mm -hmm. and. If you don't have the phonetics of your native language to transfer into the second language, it makes the learning of that second language a lot more right. difficult. Right. And uh, it just takes a lot longer. It'll happen mm -hmm. if, you're, if you stay with it, uh, but it's just, it's not nearly as quick to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you had those um, first, first language phonetics to transfer into the new, You'd pick it up. Right. So do you work with them throughout this process? Just as you said, sometimes it happens quicker than others. Do you work with them the whole time? Yes. We work with people uh, as long as they'll continue to come mm -hmm. and express a need. And so while uh, ideally, you know, some things would happen within the first 30 to 90 days. Of course, those initial core services that are required to happen in the first 30 days mm -hmm. do happen. Mm -hmm. But we often have uh, families who continue to come for English as Second Language for several years. Mm -hmm. And uh, just because they're continuing to learn, right. and, but they recognize within themselves the need uh, to continue to come. Okay, so when and where are these classes held? Um, they're held in our Refugee uh, Adult Services Center at okay. 3608 St. John. Okay. And um, the classes right now are each morning 
8.30 to noon, mm -hmm. uh, Monday through Thursday mornings. Mm -hmm. And they have to enroll in these classes, correct? Yes, they do. Um, what's the enrollment process? When does this happen? Is it like monthly or yearly? It has been every two months with a pretest to just kind of determine where uh, where the learner is mm -hmm. academically. And um, I, they'd have to call the agency to get the next enrollment date. And with these refugees, do you see most of them return back to their original country or do they stay here and become an American citizen? How does that work? Uh, most actually are here uh, and want to stay mm -hmm. uh, because for many, America represents the promised land right. for them. Exactly. Um, they're, they're here and, and cannot go back. Mm -hmm. Even though they have families at home, uh, they're oftentimes trying to get their families here as well because they're trying to escape uh, problems okay. at home. And so, you know, they work hard to become U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. and they, they work hard in jobs and uh, they, in many, many cases, they become model citizens out of gratitude for all that America represents to them. Okay. Does your organization accept any volunteers or Absolutely. how can someone get involved? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, we can always use volunteers. Uh, calling the 816-842-8040 mm -hmm. or writing on our website that you're interested in volunteering. We can use volunteer teachers in adult education, ESL, okay. as well as other areas. All right. So we're going to put some information on the screen for our viewers. If you would like to be a part of this organization and volunteer your time, you can give them a call at the number that Judy just stated at 816-842-8040 or visit the website to gain more insight at delalam.org. All right, so in, our, in closing, in our last few minutes here, people every day are discriminated based on their minority status. Mm -hmm. How do you think as a community we can come together and lower this discrimination? Well, I think if we could each just try to see the other person with our heart mm -hmm. and know that that's what Jesus has required us to do. Right to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but equally as importantly, to love, an, to love each other as if he were loving us or as if we were loving ourselves. As exactly. If, as if, as we would want to be loved. Right. And, you know, if we could each just take that step each time, we probably wouldn't have the world problems that we have. Mm-hmm. I, I, too, agree. Well, Judy Akers, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in to Joy in Our Town, TBN, St. Joseph, Kansas City. I am your host, Lindsay Hardiman, and have a wonderful week. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and made possible by your telephone dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town brought to your home every day. So write Join Our Town, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.